Uh, hello, I'm Orlando. And I'm Grace. On today's episode, we will be discussing climate injustice, uh, the fact that people who contribute the least to climate change are the ones who bear the brunt of the impact. So what is climate injustice? Who does it affect? And what can we do to stop it? To answer these questions, we have some special guests. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Music, and I am training to be a marine consultant, which basically helps uh, companies try and figure out um, how they can reduce on pollutants. Hi, my name is Jasmine Ventura, and I'm a junior at AI High School. Hi, my name is Ryan Cabo Acevedo, and I'm a senior at AI High School. Hi, my name is Dr. Kate Popejoy. I'm a science educator. I've been a science educator for many, many years. Also interested in environmental issues and glad to be here. Hi, I'm Amy Huebner and I'm a math teacher at AI DuPont High School. And I do um, run the Environmental Action Committee, which is our environmental club at AI DuPont. And I used to teach uh, some science classes. I do have a science degree as well. And I guess that's it. <laughs> That's who I am. Well, that is great. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, uh, Mr. Leonard, the uh, senior, uh, I suppose the junior upstairs, and uh, I've been teaching uh, earth science, astronomy, and environmental science here for 20 years. Uh, all right, let's discuss. So our first big question is, what is climate injustice and how does it affect the world? Uh, climate injustice is basically we're talking about how climate change is affecting and it's mostly low socioeconomic statuses. Um, you can sit there and think about it could be just, you know, nationally within our country where you can even look at fracking where um, they're doing it in low income places where people can't afford to get lawyers to say, hey, I want you to, um, you know, protect my land, protect myself, but they don't have the money to sit there and fight these big corporations that are um, affecting them. And then worldwide, it um, you can look at poorer countries who don't have access to, um, you know, simple needs, and they're getting all the backlash and all the pollution that's being sent to their country. So that's another issue. This, um, so it's basically a uh, effect of even fossil fuels have on low socioeconomic um, countries or just even nationally places within a country, our country. But how's that? That's wonderful. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, my definition, it, it's, uh, it's a little more broad with uh, not only climate change, which is definitely, uh, uh, there's an environmental justice there with the island nations and so forth, the sea level rise, uh, mostly the poor nations that need to relocate, uh, Bangladesh and India, which are at sea level. Uh, they're big ones uh, and they get affected more than anybody else. The people in charge who make these decisions on uh, not cutting back on fossil fuels and so forth, uh, they're usually the, uh, the upper elite, the 1% here in our country anyhow. And uh, you look at their houses, they're far away from any pollution or, or any hazards that uh, they would be exposed to with uh, with uh, climate change. But it's not only that, it's the uh, pollution uh, that they're exposed to. And if you just look in, uh, in Wilmington here, where are the landfills? And where's the wastewater treatment plant? East side Wilmington, right? You don't see that up in Greenville, right? Uh, so most of these things are built uh, near the low income people who don't have a say in things uh, politically, like the people, the elite up here in uh, say Greenville. I grew up with it. Uh, uh, in my neighborhood, I grew up in a poor white neighborhood, and uh, they put a, a dump there for the city of Newcastle, uh, half a mile from our, our town, which created a lot of rats. They put a, the second worst toxic waste dump in the nation, Army Creek, a mile from us. We're downwind from a plastic company, one mile down from a plastic company, and I grew up on the Delaware Rivers. And at the time I was swimming in the river, it was the most polluted ever. So uh, I have some firsthand knowledge of that because uh, I have been exposed to it. Uh, I don't know why I'm still here, to be honest with you. A lot of my friends are dying from or, or dead from cancer. Anyhow, uh, I digress. But uh, worldwide, it's a, it's a real problem right now. Uh, and uh, we need to do something about it. 
uh, the, the justice, injustice to the people who uh, don't have a say in things, right? They're too poor, they don't have uh, political connections. Flint, Michigan would be an example of how it affects the world. And it's a huge topic when talking about climate injustice and, envir and environmental justice. It was caused by faulty pipes and sewage drainage, causing the water to be full of harmful contaminants to both children and adults. Um, so what I've been looking at lately, especially because of the projects we're involved in at your school and other schools in our grant, is the idea of redlining and how in the past many, many areas of large cities especially had issues of injustice when it came to real estate. So those folks who lived in neighborhoods of color often had a hard time getting mortgages, for example, for their property and struggled with developing their area. And it's not a mistake or a really you know, radical idea to say that those are the same areas now that are also faced with issues when it comes to climate injustice. For example, those poor neighborhoods have less access to air conditioning and as part of our climate change problem, we have increased heat. And so many of those very neighborhoods that have had struggles over many years for various reasons are also being slammed when it comes to the increase in heat in our urban areas. And that of course is due to urban heat island. We all learn a little bit about that. And you find that those areas are hit the hardest. So that's the one thing that I've been really more into lately. However, in the past, I have looked at the fact that we are discarding a lot of our uh, pollutants into less uh, powerful countries, let's say. Uh, the issue with recycling is a big part of that. That's not as directly tied to climate change. That's more of an environmental thing, but it's something that I look at as well. The whole um, putting our problems on other countries is pretty central to the whole climate injustice issue, um, where big polluters and um, carbon emitters like the U.S. are not suffering as much from this issue and then they're not doing anything about it. So lots of places like coastal islands are just like, I forget the name of the island that's like already working on evacuation because it's the sea level rise is so bad. Yeah, that would but, be Kiribati in the Central Pacific. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but places like the U.S., we just ignore it because we aren't facing the direct consequences of our actions. Yeah, and that's one of the issues when you look at some of the international agreements that we have either signed or walked out of. Hopefully we'll be back in the Paris Accords now that we have our change in leadership in our country. Um, but one of the biggest issues throughout this whole process, and this whole thing started before you were born, actually, we started really worrying about climate change that those of us in the science community did. And one of the hugest things that those negotiators face at every one of those conferences is it's us, you know, we developed countries who have caused these issues with climate change. And then we turn around and tell developing countries that they can't use some of the same tools that we used to advance. So, you know, in our past, in our history, our industrial revolution began this whole process. All right, it's not just the pollution, it's also the climate change itself because of the CO2 that's put in the atmosphere. And so then we turn around and tell all these other countries that want to get to a higher level of development like we have that, well, you can't do what we did. Do, do as I say, not as I did, right? And, and that's a problem that, uh, boy, if I could fix it, I guess I'd be queen of the world. But um, that's one of the huge political problems that we have. And I think that if we in the United States and also China, which is our number one emitter now, not, not putting blame off of us, but if we, if we the ones who are doing the worst damage would you know, really sign on to do the things that could help to alleviate these issues, then we'd get more buy-in from the rest of the global community. And the fact that we walked away from the Paris Accords did not help this process in the slightest. Um, and it shows that, you know, volatility and leadership is a huge problem when it comes to these types of agreements. Um, that we have issues where, for example, you know, the Senate has to confirm all treaties that we make. Sometimes that's an issue. The Senate needed to approve the climate change stuff. Sometimes that's an issue. So what we can do here in our country is push very hard on our leadership to do what they need to do and to make us not be the, the, the oh, what's the word I want to use? Not laughing stock, that's too nice. Um, the big baddie <laughs> of the globe, because that's what we are. And it's very frustrating to those of us who have been, you know, beating this drum for a very long time, that we're still having to face this when it's so evident that this problem is here. 
So uh, I would like to say something, and that is uh, the climate injustice as a whole is a it's basically a very sad endeavor because, uh, like uh, people have said, it really affects uh, either low income communities or even nations or even peoples. Like for example, the uh, tribes of Australia, the native people of Australia who live around the bush, which is an extremely hot, very there's not a lot of water there. Um, the more the hotter and hotter it gets and the more and more the lakes dry up in their community, the harder and harder it's going to be to live there. And that's also seen in other uh, countries such as like India and Burma and uh, Tajikistan and stuff like that. So it, it's very uh, important that we basically make it so that these countries who were basically given nothing, um, that they can try and uh, you know, survive or even thrive. I would like to add something. Um, like Matthew said, like there's, it, oh, it always hits like um, low income people. I mean, yeah, like like low income community. Um, like in 20, 2005, I mean, Hurricane Katrina hit in New Orleans and it hit like really a lot of people. Um, and it was a really slow response to leaving communities of color and stranded for a very long time. And I just wanted to add that to what Matthew said. And uh, I'd like to interject as well uh, on, on what Matt was saying about Australia specifically. Uh, as a whole, I think we talk a lot about you know pollution and global warming as a source, but when it comes to environmental injustice, I think it's also important to take note that some countries have not put in effective policies to counteract the abuse of the environment. Uh, and with the example of Australia, take overfishing or the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, absolutely nothing has been done to fix many of these problems, which has resulted in the you know, destruction of beautiful landmarks and uh, the near collapse of Australia's fishing economy, which has cost thousands of people their jobs and livelihoods. And I think it's a real shame that some countries don't take initiative when making policy uh, to fit the environment to address some of these other issues, you know, not just focusing specifically on like global warming and air pollution. But there needs to be some effort put into conser conserving the natural environment around us as well. Yeah, and I'd like to add something really quick to this too. Um, and this is something where I'm speaking to younger people. I always try to be a little more positive because the issue we have is that we have countries that stand on their own, supposedly. And they're the ones that make decisions about their own country and their own borders. The problem is, is that we live in a world. We live on a globe where there are not giant walls between every country that, you know, we are all breathing the same air, using the same water, eating the same food that comes from the single place. I'm a, I'm a total globalist, I admit it. Um, that's a bad word in many of the, the ruling communities of our country right now. But I believe that until we start to see the earth as a whole and see humans as a whole population where we all have to work together to preserve our home, which is the earth. Our home is not Delaware. Our home is not the United States. It is not Argentina. It is not Puerto Rico. Our home is the earth. And what we do here has such dramatic impact throughout the entire earth. And that's a tough thing for people to understand. It's weird because I see it as so freaking obvious. And I was so excited when the European community got together and made the EU. And then what happens? You know, Great Britain runs away and hides and can't do it anymore. And they weren't even really members anyway. They sort of were. Um, still using the pound, not the euro. Um, so until we start to see ourselves as global, we are not going to get past this. And my hope is that as we continue to see migration, we see people moving from country to country, we see more and more um, interleavening of different peoples in different countries from elsewhere, like we have in our country, which I value highly, we will not see ourselves as global citizens. That's the most important thing, I think, that would change everything if we could do that. Now, again, when I'm queen of the world, that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I can't. I'm not going to be queen of the world. I wish sometimes. Um, but we need to see ourselves as a community of humans on earth. And then I think we can make real serious change. Uh, now that we've talked about how we believe climate injustice affects our world as a whole, uh, we want to ask, how do you all believe that climate injustice affects us and our local communities? 
you know, I, I, I grew up in the family of 12. I was number 11 out of 12 and in a poor neighborhood, exposed to much pollution. And so uh, a lot of my family, you know, my uh, oldest brother died of cancer and just about all my friends from that neighborhood are dead now. So it does personally affect me, and that's why I'm so passionate about it in the classroom, as, as you can tell, that, uh, you know, someone has to fight for these people uh, who, who can't fight for themselves. And uh, with climate change uh, changing the world and uh, the uh, big companies uh, like Claymont, you see Claymont's downwind from three oil refineries. I mean, that's just crazy stuff. Uh, and, and personally, uh, I feel it's my duty to inform your generation. That's why I'm passionate in the teaching of it. So you can possibly change the world, at least be aware of what's happening. I'm glad you're doing this so some of our students will be aware. And, yeah, and it's water pollution. I live in Middletown and I'm very close to Port Penn and the Delaware River is extremely um, polluted. And you're talking about a bunch of people in this area that have well water. So you have pollution coming through. They have to have um, setups and, you know, for their wells so that when they take in that water that it isn't even polluted. I know some people that refuse to even drink that water. So they, they're ending up buying plastic bottles of, or even gallon jugs or five gallon jugs of water just because they cannot drink their own water because it's polluted or they're fearful of it being polluted. Um, I'm thinking about down in um, Sussex County where you have saltwater intrusion from the ocean and that's coming in from um, you know uh, just sea level rise right there so sea level rise is affecting us. Um, I know that sea level rise is going to affect the um, city of Wilmington. It's going to take out part of Wilmington. Uh, so there's a lot of different things and um, you know just right down you know uh, Delaware has a high cancer rate for a reason, and it's because we do get a lot of pollution. We get pollution from West Virginia, all the coal mining sent over to our state, mm -hmm. and the acidification of our farmlands. So we know that's going into the farmlands. And um, just with fossil fuels as well, we know that now we have microplastics, and it's actually getting into, it's not just something that's happening in the oceans, but it's getting into our crop fields. And the problem is when these um, plants take up the microplastic, the heavy metals are attached to them. Before, when they take up the heavy metals, they could expose of it. Now it's attached to these plastics and it's getting into our food. And we're not, we're not thinking. We're not thinking about the grander scale down the road. And we wonder why we have all these new diseases. <laughs> COVID. COVID is a problem from deforestation. There's, uh, you know, and it causes a pandemic. So we just need to think ahead. We need to be more conscious. And how do we fight it? Well, we have to educate. And it's not just, it's nice to educate kids, but it's also, the adults need to be educated and they have to accept it. And I, I mean, you know, going way back to Al Gore, it is an inconvenient truth. And I'm sorry, but you know, if you are worried about your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids, you need to think about what you're doing now and how it's going to affect them. And it can't be about big corporations making money. The amount of money they make is sick. And, and just by changing a little, little things here and there, it's going to make a bigger in, um, environmental impact just by big corporations making small changes. So I would just like to say, as a uh, avid, um, basically, uh, fisherman, uh, same thing with my family, uh, the whole Delaware community has really felt um, a, uh, definitely from climate change and from overfishing, uh, felt that there is less fish in the uh, Delaware's waters. And it's kind of an interesting parallel, the fact that there are fishermen who are, you know, historically very conservative thinking, very conservative socially, but they believe in climate change and they will fight to the death uh, because they know that from when they were a little uh, kid to now, uh, down that they're like, you know, 60 years old or something, they know that the water has gone up by at least five degrees. Uh, and they know that certain fish just aren't coming uh, at certain times or just aren't coming at all. So I feel like that as a community, especially as a coastal community at that, um, we really feel the brunt of a uh, basically a climate 
change and uh, even climate injustice for a little effect. And then the lack of fish goes on and affects like the whole economy. Everything has whole unforeseen consequences. Yeah, my, my thinking is that until everyone has a direct effect, they just don't seem to want to believe it. That's a big part of it. I and mean, that's one of the discussions that's been happening all along in our society of, you know, especially elected representatives until they actually face the problem themselves, they often just discount it. Um, the classic example is a particular politician who was very anti-gay rights in the past and then his son came out as gay. Well, now maybe he thinks differently. So why did it take it happening to that politician directly for him to change his mind? You, know, you have to walk in the mile in their shoes, et cetera, et cetera. But to be honest, that's not what empathy is all about. Empathy is understanding before you've even walked in their shoes and also trusting the science. That's a huge other issue. We can do an entire months of podcasts on, but the problem we have is until it directly affects them, like the fishermen in the coastal areas, they're like, well, you know, I don't, I don't see it until they do see it. And the problem is if we wait for everyone to see direct impacts of climate change on each of them, it's too late. By then, I mean, the world has to be on fire, I guess, so people notice, you know, and, 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 and that's kind of the argument that I use with folks sometimes. They say, oh, I don't think it's real. It's like, well, okay, well, look at the data. You know, look at the rainfall versus snowfall in our area, for example. I'm in eastern Pennsylvania, so not too far from you. I actually just drove right through Wilmington a couple years or a couple months ago when I was on my way somewhere else. I was like, oh, there's the exit for AI. It's like, hey, there it is. Um, but, you know, here it's less snow. We have a lot less snow than we used to have here in eastern Pennsylvania. My husband has lived here since 1999. He discovered skiing at the age of 40. He came to it a little late. Uh, he likes to ski in our local Blue Mountain, which I always tease him. It's a little tiny hill compared to real mountains, but he enjoys it. He goes out and he does a half a day. Well, last couple of years, it's been more rain than snow. Very little snow. And that's gonna happen throughout the Eastern United States. You know, we're gonna get warmer and warmer and have more and more rain and less snow. And that's one of the direct impacts. Now, whether that's climate injustice, no, it's evidence of climate change. Um, we're very insulated here in my household. You know, my, my husband and I are very fortunate. We make a decent amount of money. We have a nice house. We have three cats. We both donate to various things like the Sierra Club because we feel a little guilty sometimes. I do have a hybrid car, finally. You know, I finally got a hybrid car. Um, but we are pretty fortunate in that we can, we're resilient. But most of the world's population is not so fortunate and resilient. Small changes can cause dramatic catastrophes in so many populations. And I think that's part of the American problem is that those who are quote in leadership unquote are often not affected by this and they don't always listen to their constituents and they should. Um, like Dr. Pope Joe said, um, you don't see it until it affects you. Like you, like she said that one of the leaders, his, his son came out as gay and I really agree with that. Um, People don't see what's going on until they like experience it for themselves. So yeah, I really agree with what she said. All right, as our little wrap up question, we have, what can we do to stop climate injustice? Cause this is a major issue and it doesn't have a simple solution, but what's something that can be done? So I think it was like the first, January 1st that Delaware um, is now charging for bags. Yeah, so like, I think that's one way we can start by, and if we, uh, if we price the bags, people are not gonna want to buy bags. So that's gonna like reduce the use of plastic. So that's one, great way to start? Uh, again, it goes back to uh, educating uh, our youth and our, our uh, what I call the ignorant America, uh, not being demeaning or anything, it's just they're not aware. And uh, that's why I get excited when, uh, you know, classes like your class, uh, I get the opportunity to spread the word to you, our future leaders and citizens who are going to be voting for the people. And let's face it, in this country, it's going to come down to who you have uh, in Congress to make the decisions for you. You see what happened in uh, the last election, right? All of our, most of our environmental laws just went uh, down the tubes. 
uh, with his current president. But uh, there's hope now. In two weeks, hopefully, we'll get back to uh, uh, the, the Paris Agreement and uh, start our, our towards the renewables. So uh, it, it all comes down to government, who you choose. And in order to choose the right person, you need to be aware of what's going on, especially on environmental issues. And that's where it's important for us teachers like uh, Ms. Huber and myself to make sure we, we emphasize uh, what you need to know before you make that decision for who your leaders are going to be. And uh, that, that's the best thing we're going to do right now. Education. Um... Uh, you know, we need to think about how we're going to change. The biggest change that we need to make is trying to find how to deal with the um, combustible engine because that's really what's sucking up uh, a lot of our fossil fuels. I think we can get a lot of, uh, away from being on the grid, from coal being our main electric source because we have solar and wind. And it, actually, the solar is getting much better. There's already um, a compound that they're starting to replace the silicon with. So, um, just making sure people are aware, not being selfish. And, and, and Mr. Leonard said something about ignorant, uh, ignorant people. It's not a derogatory term. It just means uneducated. And people are not educated in science. And as we've seen through this pandemic, there is not a lot of people looking at science very carefully and closely. And, that, and that's, for ed, that's why we're saying education is a big and huge, and it's across the board. It's not with just students, but it's also with um, business owners and anybody, you know, everybody. It's everybody has to take, you know, their turn and really think about doing the little things that will make a difference. Solar energy is 65% cheaper now than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right, and with this new administration coming in, they're probably practically going to be giving away those solar panels and, and solar shingles and electric cars and everything. So I'm waiting for that, you know, to get my electric car that I can plug into my solar panels or, or shingles and have zero emissions. And uh, I've been waiting for that day for a long time. I think it's coming. Now we have control, or uh, President Biden has control of Congress. Maybe we'll get some uh, legislation going through with renewable energy. And putting the subsidies where they belong. Uh, mm, oil amen. companies do not need those subsidies. And we're already seeing the effects on solar energy. We've already increased it to now it's above 30%. So we're getting there. It's just that we have to be conscious about what we're doing. And we need to think and we need to not be selfish. And invest in our scientists. And to all these people, our companies that are actually promoting um, finding ways to be more environmentally sound. Sierra Nevada, I probably should bring that up, but they're already using solar to um, with their company to help, you know, cut back. And it cut back, it cuts back on costs too. So it's actually going to be better for everybody in the end when you have costs cut back. In addition to that, you do want solar in your house because you can sell that back to the electric company, which go. is going to make me bring up another point. Why do we have electric companies? This is something that should be run by the government because electric companies are there to sell energy, not conserve it. So it's counterintuitive. I agree. You know, it's interesting because the whole climate thing often gets conflated with pollution and environmental impact, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I think that one of the arguments I've used with people who don't recognize climate change, I can at least help them understand that pollution is not a good thing. You know, that can we agree on that? That maybe we shouldn't have so much stuff in our landfills and that recycling might be a good idea? You know, can we agree that maybe we should um, have hybrid cars or use cars that get better mileage rather than being dependent on oil? That's a tougher one because some people are like, well, my dad works on a rig and or my mom works in the office for Texaco and you know, American jobs are provided by our oil industry. However, this is where politics comes in again. Our oil industry is heavily subsidized by the federal government. Do we subsidize solar farms? No. Do we subsidize wind power? No. You know, so we need to think about how our federal government and our state governments who stepped in after we walked out of Paris, a lot of states and cities stepped up and said, hey, we're going to live up to those requirements. We don't care if our federal people won't because their population demanded it. We need to have a political solution that can be agreed upon. And one of them is let's subsidize solar farms. Let's subsidize panels. Let's subsidize all alternative forms of energy that keep us in a cleaner state of our planet. I think we need to do all that. And that's something that is actually doable. 
you know, um, it doesn't mean we have to go around and clean up everything ourselves. It means we tell our politicians, this is what we want them to do. This is how we want them to spend our tax money. And industry's trying, you know, um, we buy green power at our house. That's another thing that we do. Um, it costs us a little bit more than the so-called regular power, but we do it. So all of our energy in our household comes from alternative forms of energy. Do we have solar panels on the roof yet? No, I'm waiting for the next technological jump. However, my house before I moved here in North Carolina, I had solar panels and they cost me an arm and a leg, but I did it because by God, I was committed. Um, and you know, I got my money back within four years. So those types of programs were possible through tax issues. My state of North Carolina gave me a tax rebate because I put panels up. At that point, there was a federal program in place too to get part of your money back that you put solar panels up for. Not there anymore, put it back. Make it easier for me, make it cheaper for me to put those things on there and I'll do it. And I'll do it because it's the right thing to do. Other people can't afford it. So make it cost you zero, zero dollars to put up solar panels on every rooftop. That's where our government can do. And that's where you, when you turn 18, if you haven't already, can start pushing hard on our representatives to get this stuff in place. Uh, so just to quickly sum up what we discussed, um, of course, we've discussed how you know governments and corporations of sorts are affecting our environments, um, how our local community with you know overfishing and so on and so forth has caused harm to our livelihoods and so on and so forth, as well as some ways we can stop climate injustice, you know, the introduction of alternate power sources and you know the whole plastic paper bag thing. Uh, Grace, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, put some pressure on your government representatives. Let's do something about this. And yeah. uh, well, all you right. You can do that now, even if you're not voting. You're, you're citizens. You live here. You can put pressure on your politicians right now. You don't have to wait till you can vote. Just pointing that out. Well, uh, in that case, uh, thank you to everyone who's come here to talk about our uh, climate and justice uh, podcast with us. Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>